to close out our series of, of panels and of speakers, we have um, Kara Drynin, who's the author of a book, a new book called The War on Kids, When and Why the Juvenile System, ju pardon me, The War on Kids, When and Why the Juvenile Justice System Went Wrong. So without further ado, Kara, please. Good morning, it's almost good afternoon, I realize. Um, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thanks uh, to all of you for being here. I feel especially grateful to journalists at this point in history, so I just want to encourage you to keep at it. <laughs> um, and congratulations to you for this particular fellowship. So I know that you've heard a lot about juvenile justice in the last couple of uh, sessions and actually last couple of days. Uh, Joe had asked me to sort of step back and share with you my research, which um, uh, that title introduction was a little off. It, it's how American juvenile justice lost its way. Um, and so, uh, so I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit about that and, and step back, as I said, and explain in greater detail. Um, where we are today, why I think there is a war on kids in 2018 still, um, and how we got here. Because as we all know, uh, past is prologue, so it's important to understand how we got here. And I will promise to keep it um, relatively brief. Joe had asked me to talk for about um, 25 minutes, and I will stick to that because I know you have questions, and I'm also the only thing standing between you and lunch. So, <laughs> um, so I want to open by telling you a little bit about an individual named Terrence Graham. And you may have heard about Terrence and his case in the last couple of days or in your own research. Um, Terrence is one of the reasons I, I wrote The War on Kids. So I wanted to just share with you, for those who aren't familiar with his case, um, in 2003, when Terrence was 16, he and three friends tried to rob a barbecue restaurant in Jacksonville, Florida. One of the friends um, propped open the back door to the restaurant at, <clears throat> excuse me, at closing. <clears throat> and one of Terrence's um, co-defendants struck the manager when he confronted them. Terrence himself did not wield or use a weapon. They left when this manager confronted them. They left with no money. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and Terrence was charged with armed burglary and attempted armed robbery. He was initially sentenced to life without parole for his involvement in that crime in Florida. Um, and before sentencing him to die in prison, maybe even more astonishing than the sentence itself was the fact that the judge said to him, I don't know why it is why you'd throw your life away. You know, actually use the, the words, you know, why you'd be given such a, a, quite a family structure and throw your life away. Um, in fact, nothing could have been further from the truth, right? And as I came to learn in my research, um, the truth about Terrence's childhood is that he grew up in abject poverty with two crack-addicted parents. Um, while others were getting high in his own childhood home, he and his siblings were sent out to roam the streets of the projects where he lived. Um, Terrence endured physical and verbal abuse documented by social services back to the time he was a toddler. And by the 10th grade, the year he was arrested for that attempted armed robbery, um, he had attended nine schools already because his family was moving so frequently. And so I mention that because despite what that judge said at his sentencing, life was violent and chaotic and traumatic for Terrence. And Terrence is not alone, right? As the title of my book suggests, in my opinion, the United States has waged a war on kids. And as you have been hearing today and yesterday, um, like most wars, this war has had its biggest impact on poor, minority, and otherwise vulnerable kids. So just some basic facts. There are more than 50,000 kids locked up on any given day in America. You might be thinking those are the worst of the worst. They're not. About a quarter of kids in detention in this country are there for things like truancy and curfew violations, status-based crimes, right? things that would not be a crime if they were not committed by a minor. We've been talking about the fact that prosecutors routinely take kids out of juvenile court and charge them in adult court as if they were an adult. Youth in adult court, and this often gets lost, youth in adult court, once they are there, they're subject to mandatory sentences that were drafted with adults in mind. Youth can be kept in adult jails and prisons, despite the fact that we know they're at the greatest risk of physical and sexual assault in those facilities, as well as suicide. Um, kids in prison uh, are subject to things like mechanical restraints, solitary confinement, 
things that were designed for and in my opinion are only appropriate for the most dangerous of adult offenders, not for kids. Until 2005, the United States was the only nation to execute people for juvenile crimes, and today we are the only nation that sentences kids to die in prison. So, as I said, um, these devastating practices have not affected all American youth equally. And it's interesting to me because as I've been traveling and talking about my research, people often say to me, what war on kids? All you hear about are helicopter parents, and, and now there's a, you know, the lawnmower parent, and um, what about all these overindulged kids? Or what about the fact that youth detention is down dramatically? Right? These are sort of dissonant facts. So um, first, I want to say, yes, there are some very privileged kids in America but about 20% of kids in America live at or below the federal poverty definition line. And that's actually um, not a generous definition, so by many metrics, it's a much higher number. It's much closer to um, about a third of kids in America. And just like in the adult system, youth who are poor are much more likely to be accused of a crime, convicted of a crime, and detained for a crime. So a poor child might be in the system because his or her family can't afford an attorney and their public defender is swamped. Um, a poor child might be in the system because their family cannot afford the diversion program that would afford addiction treatment. A poor child might be in the system because their family can't afford the fee associated with an ankle bracelet that would permit them to stay out of a locked facility. So that's just a simple truth, that poverty shunts kids into the system who would not be there if they had the means to buy their way out. And the second thing is that yes, youth detention rates are down from their peak in the 90s and that is excellent, but um, I was happy to hear on the prior panel just driving home this notion that we have to focus on the fact that even as youth detention rates have declined dramatically, minority youth are not benefiting from that downward trend in the way that white youth are. So black youth today are twice as likely, actually more than twice as likely as white youth to be arrested and they're five times as likely as white youth to be detained. So because of those numbers, nationally we look and see that about 16% of youth in America are black, right? Black youth comprise about 16% of our total youth population. They make up 44% of detained youth. So there's just massive overrepresentation among minority youth. And actually, in some jurisdictions, that figure I gave you, that 16 to 44 overrepresentation number, in some states, it's even more pronounced, right? That's a national figure. So I work in Washington, D.C. I live in actually in Virginia. And last weekend, I was doing some work with the NAACP in, in Northern Virginia. And um, in preparation for that, I was digging into the numbers in Virginia. Well, in Virginia, black youth make up only 20% of juveniles, but 71% of admissions to closed facilities. And it's just astonishing, um, especially given the fact that we know um, black youth are not committing crimes like drug use or fist fights at a much higher rate than white youth. That, that is not what is driving that differential. So despite some promising reforms, um, there continues to be a war on kids in America. And as I said, it's a war that has been devastating for poor minority youth. So at this point, I want to sort of step back, having talked a little bit about what this war on kids looks like, um, the extremity of our sentencing, and I want to answer the question of how we got here. Um, as I say in the title of my book, How American Juvenile Justice Lost Its Way, because I think, I know, having um, gone around the, many parts of this country to talk about my research, People can't wrap their head around some of these facts. They think, how can a child be sentenced to die in prison when they're not old enough to get a tattoo or old enough to vote? Right? These are hard to understand concepts. So I want to um, spend a little time talking about how we got here. Um, and the first thing I want to point out is that the war on kids, much like mass incarceration itself, is a very recent phenomenon. Right. So. Um, the U.S. invented the juvenile court model in Illinois at the end of the 19th century. It was not perfect by any stretch, but it was predicated on this idea, this shared idea that kids are different, right? This intuitive concept that kids, if they act out, if they're accused of committing a crime, they probably are in need of some social service, right? They're not um, requiring the same kind of knee-jerk um, incarceration that we would impose upon an adult. 
And over the course of the 20th century, every state in this country and all developed nations around the globe adopted that model, right, with the recognition that that, that is just intuitively appealing and, and common sense. Um, but something interesting happened in America. While we were exporting this idea that kids are different, and while developed nations around the globe were adopting that juvenile court model, we began to systematically abandon the idea that kids are different domestically here in the United States. And I think to understand that trajectory, I, I describe in the book that really the war on kids is a subplot to the story of mass incarceration. Right? So as I said, this is a new dynamic. Um, you all know we have more than 2 million adults um, and children behind bars in this country, and that's just an astonishing figure. What you may not know is how new that astonishing figure is. Right, so as recently as 1970, there were about 300,000 people incarcerated in this country. So that means that in my lifetime, we've seen an eight-fold increase in our correctional population. That's a massive explosion, right? And as you know, um, we have 5% of the world's population, 25% of its prisoners. The land of the free has become the world's largest jailer. Now, entire books have been written on that phenomenon, right, on how mass incarceration happened. Um, if you haven't read those entire books, let me just give you a few headlines of that, right? Beginning in the 1960s in this country, um, violent crime was on the rise, right? And it remained on the rise until um, about the 1990s, mid-90s, steadily. And in response, politicians across the political spectrum embraced a tough on crime sense of politics, right? All politicians put more crimes on the books, they enhanced penalties for crimes, and you can do the math. As we sent more and more people to prison for longer and longer periods of time, our correctional population exploded. Okay, so as I said, mass incarceration has not affected Americans equally. Four out of five people in America charged with a crime are poor. 80% of people charged with a crime are poor. Okay, so um, even though they are entitled to a lawyer under the Sixth Amendment, and, and, and that entitlement is to a zealous, effective representation, that rarely happens. Despite the best intentions of public defenders, they are usually so overworked and underfunded <clears throat> that that zealous representation can't happen, right? More than 90% of cases are resolved in this country through a plea bargain. That is not what the Sixth Amendment contemplated. Right? As, as Michelle Alexander and others have explored in depth, minorities in America today are exponentially more likely to be under some kind of correctional supervision. African Americans are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of whites. Black and Hispanic populations make up less than a third of our overall population, but more than half of our correctional population. So again, dramatic overrepresentation. And I think it's important to mention that one in 13 black men has lost the right to vote in America because of a prior felony conviction. So these are criminal justice practices that involve not just incarceration, which is finite in some cases, right? These are policies that have resulted in social and political excommunication of huge swaths of our, of our country. And that tough on crime era, those same politics that I just described with respect to adults, that momentum affected kids too. And I want to talk about three ways in, in, in particular that it did. Um, transfer laws, I want to say something about mandatory minimums and, and a little bit about zero tolerance policies in schools. So the first are, are transfer laws. Um, I, I know, uh, for, based on listening to the last panel, I think it was really important that they clarified the difference between raise the age and transfer laws, right? So let me back up for a minute and maybe hopefully clarify a little bit. Um, so most of the 20th century, in this, for most of the 20th century in this country, if a child was accused of a crime, they were dealt with in juvenile court, or as um, some states refer to as family court. In rare cases, if a prosecutor thought that crime is so extreme that, that it exceeds what we can actually do in juvenile court, then a DA could petition the judge to move that case into adult court. But that transfer was rare and it was difficult. Right? You had to convince that judge, the prosecutor had to convince a judge of that need. But as part of this tough on crime politics of the 1980s and the 1990s, Lawmakers passed transfer laws that made it easy and common for kids to get put in adult court. So today, regardless of the age of majority, which is what we were discussing earlier, regardless of the default age at which a child is viewed as an adult in a given state, 
every jurisdiction has some provision, most have a handful, that allow a child to be charged as if they were an adult. Okay? 23 states and the District of Columbia have at least one transfer law that has no minimum age. Theoretically, an eight-year-old in certain cir circumstances could be charged as an adult in 23 states and in the District of Columbia. So I can't emphasize enough that through this legal fiction, states can prosecute a child as if they were an adult. And that is really, we are dealing with that. It's a vestige of this whole tough on crime politics of the 80s, and we're stuck with it. And as you, as you saw and heard moments ago, trying to unravel the harms of some of that is going to take a long time. So second thing I want to talk about, mandatory minimums. Around the same time, mid 80s, 1990s, federal and state lawmakers moved away from discretionary sentencing schemes, right? Instances when a judge could exercise some discretion to what are called determinate sentencing schemes, where the legislature predetermined what a defendant would be sentenced to if convicted, right? So you are probably familiar with, with mandatory minimums in general. You may have heard of three strikes provisions, um, truth and sentencing statutes in some states that say if you are convicted of crime X, you will serve 70 to 80 percent of the term before you're eligible for release. So all of these were part of that movement to, um, to look at the offense rather than the offender to dehumanize the experience of criminal sentencing and say the legislature has determined in advance any person convicted of crime X will receive sentence Y. So in my research, what's interesting is it's not even clear that lawmakers were thinking about the interaction of transfer laws and mandatory minimums. But this was the perfect storm for kids because those transfer laws that I described made it easy and common for kids to land in adult court and then once there, if convicted, they were subject to those mandatory minimums that were likely drafted with adults in mind. So that was really a perfect storm. Um, and, it's, and it's deeply problematic. There are only two states in the union that have, have um, recently said mandatory minimums are not applicable to youth because they were not designed for them and because they um, don't map onto what we know about kids and what brain science tells us about kids. Um, and, and so uh, that's something I think would be, um, I would love to see more coverage on that issue, on that interaction. Um, Iowa was the first state to come out and say, we're not going to have any of our mandatory minimum sentencing schemes apply to youth. Um, and that was a, a case that um, involved two high school students who got into a fight over a $5 bag of marijuana. And um, one of the students punched the other and grabbed the bag. Well, he was charged as an adult. And because of the use of force, punching and grabbing the $5 bag of marijuana, he was charged with a second degree robbery. Because of the fact that he'd been put in adult court and because there were mandatory minimums, the judge in his case had no choice but to impose a 10 year sentence, seven of which had to be served before he was parole eligible. So you can just see the insanity of a situation like that where because of this combination of transfer law and mandatory minimums, even judges who think it's unfair, their hands are tied in a situation like that. Okay, as if those two trends weren't bad enough, um, transfer laws and mandatory minimums, I want to say a little bit about the school to prison pipeline, um, uh, a phenomenon which, with which I'm sure you are familiar. Um, in the late 20th century, schools became a pipeline to the criminal justice system for some kids. And two things were driving that. One, um, as I said before, there, there was a, a spike in violent crime in the late 20th century. And so part of the response to that was this notion of let's put um, cops in schools to crack down on, on drug and related offenses. And around the same time, you've heard about the, um, the, the research um, from Princeton political scientist John Duilio, who predicted this juvenile super predator wave, right? Um, he was wrong about it. Um, once that theory was debunked and he owned it publicly that he had been wrong about it, uh, the problem was that the train had left the station, right? And as you all know, states and local counties had adopted policies about youth that reflected this fear, this dynamic that kids can be threatening and harmful and that they are to be contained rather than um, fostered. And it really um, changed the way schools dealt with children too. So um, in the 1990s, schools began to introduce security measures that, that historically were reserved for criminal justice efforts, right, for law enforcement measures. So um, surveillance cameras, metal detectors, drug sniffing dogs, you know, locked doors and gates. Um, and as I said, the most visible part of this trend was the presence of cops in schools. 
Um, they uh, are referred to as school resource officers or SROs, but they are law enforcement. Um, and about a third of schools in America have, have SROs. Um, another 43% of schools rely upon private security. Um, I have a middle schooler uh, who is in a public school in Virginia. He has both. He has a cop in his school and private security. Um, and and uh, SROs right now are the fastest growing segment of law enforcement. So you have police in schools along with surveillance equipment that we think of as uh, law enforcement uh, protocols, and at the same time, schools adopted zero tolerance policies. I think of those as mandatory minimums for kids in schools, right? Predetermined sentences, sanctions for behaviors um, that, when imposed, take no account of the child or what might be going on for that child or why they might be acting out in the classroom, or maybe their, um, their behavior is reflective of a disability. No account for that. Um, and so, uh, in 22 states, it's a crime to disturb school. I don't know exactly what that means, um, but I would say that it leads to enormous uh, arbitrary, in some instances, discretion as to who is disturbing school. Um, and, and sadly, the, the kinds of things that are driving kids into the criminal justice system for disturbing school are the kinds of things that four decades ago would have landed a child in the principal's office. Right, that would have required some kind of disciplinary sanction rather than arrest. I also want to mention, while arrest is probably the worst case scenario for a child, suspension and expulsion are um, common and are equally damaging to a child. Maybe not equally, but closely, closely behind an arrest. Um, we know that students who are excluded from school as a punishment, even if it's for a day or, um, or more permanently, not only do they lose that instructional time, but, but studies show that they experience a sense of disenfranchisement, of social excommunication. And that is why there is a clear link between suspensions and high school dropouts, and then between high school dropouts and future incarceration. So. Um, I realize I'm flying through a lot of history, <laughs> uh, but that, that's sort of the short story of how juvenile justice lost its way in America. Um, and as I said, it's really a subplot to the story of mass incarceration. Um, we have made some important strides in the last few decades. Um, and before I close, I just want to mention um, really a, a couple of things. One, some grounds for optimism, and then at least flag where I think we need to focus our attention. So um, first, grounds for optimism. I just want to say briefly that uh, I know you heard from others regarding some of the development at the Supreme Court on juvenile sentencing. And I want to just reiterate why I think those decisions are so important, um, especially on this day, <laughs> as I think about where the court is going on this front. Um, so Roper versus Simmons, Graham versus Florida, Miller versus Alabama, these decisions um, are likely familiar to you. If not, I'm happy to talk more about them during Q&A. But um, sometimes people say, well, those are, n those are really just nibbling around the margins, right? You're just dealing with the most extreme sanctions at law for kids, whether it's the death penalty or juvenile life without parole. And that is true, but what is also true is that the court exercises enormous moral authority and has, has historically, um, been able to really push social change um, by changing the narrative, right? So one of the consequences of the Miller Trilogy of Cases is that we all now have people talking about brain science and juvenile brain development in a much more frequent and well-versed way than we did before these cases. So um, those cases are incremental. They've only uh, outlawed execution and narrow, narrowed down the, the scope of permissible JLWAP cases. But importantly, they stand for the proposition that kids are different, that they are biologically and neurologically different, and that the, the Constitution requires our laws to reflect that difference. So as a lawyer, you know, that I wear the lawyer hat sometimes, I wear the teacher hat sometimes. As a lawyer, that's an important tool to be able to hold states' feet to the fire and, and um, insist upon that differential treatment. Okay, and then before I move to Q&A, I just want to mention a few things that um, the reform front. I have a whole chapter on sort of technical reforms, and again, I'm happy to address that if folks are interested, but I just want to say a couple of things. First and foremost, as we think about kind of where we go from here, um, 
First and foremost, we have to continue to press for criminal justice reform nationally at a, at a broader level, not just on kids, because, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, our, our criminal justice practices, not just our JJ practices, but our criminal justice practices affect kids in this country who aren't even in the system yet, right? So if you take into account the fact that 2.7 million kids have an incarcerated parent, um, and we know that having a, parent, a parent who experiences incarceration is correlated with that child's own future incarceration. So these are kids who are being affected by criminal justice practices before they themselves have any interaction. Um, I, I cannot overstate the difference in mood and tone and political climate from the, the point when I finished this manuscript to this day. And that's only been about it, two years. So you guys have an enormously important role in, in reiterating for America that we are not experiencing a historic crime wave, right? That in fact, we are at a historic crime low and that the blips that are happening in certain urban areas are just that, so far they are blips. And seasoned criminologists will tell you they don't quite yet understand those blips yet. So the idea that they are indicative of some massive crime wave requiring a law and order regime is misguided and dangerous. So you guys are sort of on the front lines of holding that. Um, we obviously need to work toward securing the implementation of those Supreme Court cases that I was talking about. You know, there are some really positive signs. Um, at the time, uh, the year before the court heard Miller dealing with juvenile life without parole, only five states banned that sentence. Today, only a handful of years later, that has more than quadrupled that number. Um, parole reviews are underway for many juvenile lifers in this country. Some juvenile lifers are, are back in society and have been reunited with their families. So that's all really important. Um, but there are some less encouraging fronts where um, there's ongoing litigation that you may have heard about yesterday that, that really will um, require enforcement going, going forward. And I would say the last thing is that we really need to, all of us who are interested in juvenile justice issues, we really need to find some way of changing the dialogue, um, and this was referred to on the last panel, about youth incarceration. Right? And, and instead of viewing youth incarceration as the way to keep the public safe, viewing youth incarceration as a threat to public safety. Right? Driving home for people, educating people on the idea that youth incarceration has what's called a criminogenic effect on kids. It makes kids more likely to commit future crime. That's a threat to public safety. Right? And it's easy to understand why. Right? Most youth report that their experience of incarceration is one of constant threat, where they basically have to choose between being victimized or victimizing others, fighting off those victimizations. And those are the exact opposite skill sets from what those youth need to be productive members of society. Right? So as I said, I think if we could take control over the dialogue and reframe youth incarceration as a threat to public safety because of its uh, criminogenic effect on kids, as opposed to being the default way to meet the needs of public safety, that would go a long way. So I will stop there, and I look forward to your questions. OK, thank you very much for that really um, excellent overview. Now, um, be, when I introduced you, I did, I'm, I write books myself, and I did the most terrible thing you can do to an author, which is to mangle the, uh, the, the title of the book. And I want to say, okay. uh, again, the title of Kara's book is The War on, uh, War on Kids, How American Juvenile Justice Lost Its Way. The War on Kids, How American Juvenile Justice <laughs> Lost Its Way. And I also forgot to mention that Kara is a professor of law at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. Your questions, please. Any, anybody? A couple. Yeah. Hi, uh, Spencer Whitney from uh, San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, that I'm reporting on, and was just very interested, is um, this came up yesterday, and then also in your speech as well, um, just giving some of the stats in regards to you know this widening uh, racial gap when it comes mm -hmm. to a lot of the sentencing. Detainees, particularly with African Americans, but obviously also um, with you know like Hispanic youth as well. Uh, my question is, how is is there a certain way to address that now that it isn't being looked at in another way? For example, you know we've talked about you know like raise the age and re mm -hmm. resentencing laws, but it not necessarily trick basically trickling down to like I know a lot of um, you know African American youth and that type of thing. So. What, I, what is kind of missing in that conversation, or what is the link that's 
you know, not being connected so that that disparity can actually be addressed? Right. So one thing I would say is, um, and this is it, like not a, um, a palatable response. People think like, oh, data, that's not a very sexy answer. But the truth is what we need is data. And so, for example, um, again, I, I mentioned I was working with the NAACP in Virginia last week. One of the things in Virginia, I'll just give you that example, and I know from hearing other panelists and talking to folks in the field, this is true in other jurisdictions. In order to address disproportionate minority contact, we need to know exactly where that's happening. I mean, we have some rough metrics. I mentioned that black youth are more than twice as likely as white youth to be arrested. So we know that they're getting picked up on the front end of the system in a way that white youth are not. It is true um, for Latino youth as well, but um, a slightly less egregious disproportionate. So one thing we need to do is just be able to identify within states and counties exactly where those disparities are happening. Um, and then, you know, the, the harder task, I think, is having a really transparent conversation about why that's happening. Um, there's been a lot of social science research, for example, on the, on the question of why black youth are arrested at more than um, two times the rate of white youth. There is some research that indicates, for example, some important explanations. Um, black youth are consistently perceived as older than they are by white adults, right? So that means that black principals, SROs, cops, are ascribing to those youth an age much older than they are, and therefore perceiving that you know, fist fight maybe as more threatening, thinking it's happening at, at the hands of an adult or someone they think of as more than an adult. Um, and also that um, adults throughout the system, in the school and in the criminal justice system, respond very differently to the same behaviors depending upon the race of the child. Right, so a, a black youth in the classroom who's acting out is a threat to the um, classroom, a disruption to the classroom, maybe even a threat to public safety. White kid does the same thing, he's the class clown, right? And so we need to be able to have the data and then be able to have really transparent conversations about that. And that's hard, right? I mean, that gets at issues of implicit bias and structural racism. And so I, I think we're starting to have those conversations, but it's gonna be a long road. Yes, uh, thank you for your brilliant presentation. It's oh, really thanks. a privilege. Um, I'm Art Levine with Juvenile Justice Information Exchange, freelancer, and I'm also the author of a book called Mental Health Inc. that looked at maltreatment of kids in the addiction and behavioral health field and so on that, that leads to bad outcomes. Here's what I wanted to ask you about. Sure. Is one, uh, first of all, uh, we're, I, I, I think I'm speaking for many people. We're very glad you're here. You're gonna be like an all-purpose, wise, spokesperson expert a la Shelby Foote and Ken Burns Civil Wars thing that we can call you for your all-knowing insight into the system. So thank you so much. But here's my question. In your book, which I haven't read yet, which I will be rushing out to get, is I <laughs> want to understand, did you do any original narrative-based reporting where you are reporting on individual anecdotes or narratives that were not previously reported in lawsuits or news stories? And if so, how did you get those stories and what pointers might you have for the rest of us who are trying to like tell, you know, needing to use the narrative to make yeah. readers understand the data and analysis that you've so excellently uh, provide it, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. So that's a really important question. I do use um, personal narratives in, in the story, uh, in the book, rather, um, to tell stories, as you said, to do what you all want to do, which is humanize these experiences for the average reader. I did it in a couple of, of ways. Um, so one is um, Terrence uh, plays uh, very centrally in the book because of the importance of his case um, in terms of setting in motion the changes in the legal landscape. And also because, quite frankly, when you look at his experience and then the profile of kids who end up in the criminal justice system, he's the poster child for how that happened, right, in terms of the combination of race and poverty and poor educational opportunities and a lack of intervention by social services when it probably was warranted and family history of incarceration and, and, and. So um, so he was a very central um, part of this. He had already gotten publicity, though. Right? Yes, he had. Okay, so you're saying people who had not. Um, there were, how did I find other individuals? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so they, so in chapter six of the book, let me just say, some of the, um, 
uh, avenues that I pursued in research came to me because you may have this experience, but I have um, prisoners write to me all the time. And that's just because of my research for years having been around the implementation of issues like Graham versus Florida. Um, before This was my first book. I typically have written law review articles. Um, talk about not sexy, <laughs> uh, you know, around the issues of implementing these cases. But, um, but prisoners are very interested in those issues and often would reach out to me and say, you know, here's my issue, and that would lead me down another path. There are three individuals um, whom I profile in a, chap in a latter chapter of the, of the book that talks about sort of going forward. How did I find them? One of them, um, uh, George Toka, his case was covered briefly. He was the case, his, his was the case that was originally meant to um, uh, be the case for which the court would deal on the question of retroactivity in Miller. So um, I dug into the story much more at length. Um, his case ended up being rendered moot because the prosecutor offered him a plea. So it did not go to the Supreme Court, but that's how I found him initially, sort of a, a pending case. And then the others, um, uh, other individuals um, were, two of them uh, were subject to uh, a parole hearing in Massachusetts. And I was very focused on Massachusetts at the time because it was one of only a handful of states that was actually engaging in parole hearings. Um, and that's how I found those individuals. But neither of those two individuals had had their cases, uh, you know, really um, had they garnered much attention other than in the context of a group. Um, and that was just a question of reaching out to their attorneys and asking them if they would be willing to speak and, and going down a list. I mean, Massachusetts had a number of people, um, and, and many of their attorneys you know, did not want to do that. So it's sort of going down a list, I would say. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, Jim, I work at KJZZ Public Radio in Phoenix. Um, so just this morning I learned that three uh, juvenile females being held at the Arizona Women's Prison are being transferred to a men's prison in Tucson to be held with the juveniles at that prison. So, and so there are 49 of the males. And so my question is, what kinds of questions would you ask? And do you have any tips for a FOIA on that that I would maybe wouldn't necessarily think of? And what then, kinds of questions would I ask on? And, well, like, you know, about that, about that process. Like, I've already fired off a kind of an email, like, but, you know, just knowing what you know about uh, juveniles being housed in this is the first time, this is like a major policy change, you know, and they're saying that they've gone back and look at like five years of data and they think it's gonna save them, you know, it's gonna like uh, allow for better programming, et cetera, but. So I didn't hear the, the beginning of your question. You said there were three female youth? Yes, sorry, there are three female juveniles okay. being, being held at a women's prison. Yeah. In our only women's prison in Arizona. And then they announced that they're being moved to be with the juvenile males, which is at an all male prison in Tucson. Yeah. And they said they're doing this so that they can uh, work together on, like, you know, they can do their classes together, yes. they can do visitations together, but everything else is going to be separated, et cetera. So other than basic, like, you know, why are you doing this, How, you know, et cetera, I just wonder if you had any, any red flags go up or anything? Or? Um, not, none. <laughs> um, yeah, Arizona has, has a number of issues that are really, um, unfortunately, the state has a bad record on a lot of issues on that front. So, I mean, I guess my questions would be, even if that's the right move to keep kids with kids, um, what kinds of protections are being put in place for the girls who are going to join an all-male facility um, other than things like segregated showers, right? I would wanna know what kinds of counseling services are available, how are they dealing with things around um, adolescent development, you know, how, how are they actually tailoring the services to deal with girls? Um, you, you may know that even as, you, as detention rates are sort of stabilizing in the youth system and in some states, decarceration is happening, women and girls are on the rise. So um, you might ask about that and, and sort of what their plans are in the future on, on that front. And I know you guys got to eat. It's really hard to be the pre-lunch. <laughs> you are very patient. So any more questions um, before we bid uh, a fond farewell? Thank you. Kara, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Um, copies of your book, are they available online? That we can yeah, just post they're on them? Amazon. Um, I have some postcards of the book that I'll leave here. And if questions come up and you guys want to reach out either email or phone, that's, I'm happy to talk. I talk to journalists all the time.
<laughs> it's called the war, are, yes, the war on Kids. Yes, the War on Kids. Thank you. The War on Kids. Okay, thanks, guys. We'll wait for version two. Yes. The end of the War on Kids. Yeah.